Well, this property, Woodley, uh, I basically bought off my brothers and sisters. My, my family, my great-grandparents were the first white settlers in this area at Matakoi. I took over the farm basically when I got elected to Parliament in 1984. And all through my 29-year parliamentary career and the four years as High Commissioner to the United Kingdom and Ambassador to Ireland and High Commissioner to Ghana and Nigeria, I ran the farm. I ran the farm from London. Fortunately, you know, everything online, my breeding program in Dropbox and uh, was able to run the place from London. And so I've been farming here since 1987 when my father died and uh, 900 acres, used to have a thousand, had to sell a hundred to renovate the uh, family home and uh, and I, I love the land here. It's uh, quite a lovely property, part of it on the Ruaway Flats, part on the hills with native bush and the name Woodley is determined from Woodley Hill on my left over here which is a lovely block of native bush and uh, and so as a kid I used to look after my father's Angus stud almost all my life, apart from the 20 years I was away at boarding school, university, and then at marketing, international marketing in Wellington, I've really been here on the farm. I, I have a, I mean, I, I lived in Australia for six years. I did my PhD at the Weight Research Institute, the University of Adelaide, and I loved Australia. I had a great life over there. I was, uh, I had a television science show on television for children after school. I was, uh, at, rowing in the South Australian State 8. I was a pretty good sportsman and, and I loved it. But I, my love of the land here was even greater and uh, that's what brought me, brought me back to, uh, to Woodley. Basically, um, while I'm surrounded by dairy farms, Rua is basically a dairy farming area. Uh, I, I'm not interested in dairy farming, although I did work once for the New Zealand Dairy Board managing part of their marketing business around Southern and Eastern Asia. But I've always loved beef cattle and uh, uh, you know, as I grew up with uh, looking after my father's Angus stud, my scrapbook as a kid was full of pictures of Angus cattle and Romney sheep. And, and so when I took over the farm, I wanted to get back into breeding cattle. And, uh, and my father had dispersed the Angus stud when I went away to university and interbred uh, some old Angus cows with the bought in some Frisian cows. We had an old Angus bull and interbred the lot and we basically when I took over this place we had a beef herd that was essentially an Angus Frisian beef herd so they had a we got the frame up and uh, and they milked far better than the old Angus used to milk and I think you know you'll see in my breeding cows today that milking abilities come right through you'll see cows that have calved in the last few days with tremendous udders and they milk they milk very well. Well I would, when I um, started you know, when I took over the farm again and wanted to get into breeding cattle seriously I wanted to uh, do some put more beef on that Angus Frisian base I had and I looked at South Devons I looked at limousines I and I we bought a couple of limousine bulls and and so some like there's a bit of limousine blood in my cattle as well but then in about 1987 I read about these Belgian blues and what fascinated me about them was the modification to their myostatin gene. All we mammals like us have got a myostatin gene and it controls the amount of muscle that we develop on our bodies. And, uh, and in fact the gene was discovered in, in these Belgian blue cattle. And mice of course are mammals and we can now in the lab change the myostatin gene in mice and the mice grow 20% more muscle. And so I was fascinated by that uh, technology, if you like, and decided to import some embryos and import some Belgian blue semen. And so I started upgrading from that Angus Frisian, essentially Angus Frisian base, to purebred Belgian blues. It takes about, takes about three or four generations. You first you get a half bred, then a three quarter bred, then seven eighths bred, and finally a 15 sixteenths. And we considered, the Belgian Blue Society considered a 15 sixteenth animal to be a purebred. Now what I wanted to do was focus on two or three things. I wanted to keep the pole gene from the Angus because the Belgian Blues is a horn breed. So at the moment over 90% of my calves born each year now are polled. And so I've succeeded in that. I wanted to smooth out their shoulders so that they would carve naturally. Because I believe as a beef farmer it's no use keeping heifers until they're two years old before they, you mate them. It's no use uh, not carving an animal till it's three years old. They've got to carve as two-year-olds. And, and so I wanted to be able to mate yearling heifers to my Belgian blue bulls so I smoothed out their shoulders so that they would carve easily and made sure that I had animals of 
of a, if anything, a shorter gestation because in my experience, you get far fewer calving problems with a shorter gestation um, sire. And, and so I've succeeded in um, doing that. My, I make my yearlings to my Mel Belgian blue bulls and they're calving at the moment. In the first five days, of, I've got 47 two-year-old heifers calving. Um, the first five days, 15 of them have calved and we've, it was one breech, had to assist that one, and one calf that was a little bit big, uh, 36 kilo calf, and we had to give that one a bit of a hand as well, but it was only 36 kilos. But all the rest have popped out uh, on their own. My, my average uh, calf weight, because we weigh every calf at birth, I've got going back 30 years, every calf born on this place I've got as birth weight. So I've got you know complete records going back 30 years on these animals. And our average birth weight is about, at the moment, is 40 kilos. And, uh, and that's pretty consistent. And you'll have seen calves today that were born yesterday on my place and you can see they're not big calves you know they'd, they'd be 40 42 the heaviest of them maybe 43 kilos i think um, over the years when you're developing and because i've basically developed a new breed princess anne reckoned i should call them kiwi blues uh, <laughs> but uh, you know it, it is basically a new breed a pole belgian blue with smoother shoulders that grows very rapidly you know I've, this year I've been sending 21 to 23 month old bulls to the works. I want to get rid of them before their second winter, which is starting right now. And uh, they've averaged so far 425 kilos on the hooks. That's a fabulous weight. I mean, they're worth a lot of money. And, uh, and you know, that's, we've had a drought here. They don't get fed, they've only had grass in a drought year. And that's been the average so far. The heaviest got up to 480 kilos on the hooks and killed out at 60, almost 66% a carcass to live weight and 480 kilos carcass weight at uh, that bull would have been 23 months old and you know those are those are fabulous uh, fabulous weights so i've really focused on early growth making sure that because i don't believe in the future there's farmers should be keeping animals beyond that second winter if, if you've got to keep an animal till it's two and a half years old three years old before you can kill it that's hopelessly inefficient Think of all the carbon emissions going up there. If we're serious about carbon emissions, you cannot be keeping an animal to two and a half, three years old before you process it. We've got to be aiming to process them at a younger age so there's less, uh, meat, less carbon emissions associated with that kilogram of beef. My, back, my PhD is in ruminant metabolism, so I you know, know a little bit about the, uh, uh, the efficiency of, of, uh, of meat production, if you like. And one of the physiological facts is with a ruminant animal, the more fat you try to lay down in the carcass, the more energy it will cost. It is energetically far more expensive to lay down a kilogram of fat than a kilogram of muscle. And because the Belgian Blue lays down far more muscle, it's far more efficient. If you look at the different breeds, the fatter breeds grow more slowly for good reason. The leaner breeds grow more quickly. I mean, it's not just Belgian Blues. Charolais are leaner, they grow more quickly. Simmental are leaner, they grow more quickly. Limousins are leaner. Angus tend to be fatter, grow not quite as fast. Herefords, fatter, quite, not quite as fast. Wagyu, fatter again, grow much more slowly. And it's simple physiological fact that if you've got an animal laying down more fat, it's going to grow more slowly. And as we look to the future, if we are serious about carbon emissions, we cannot produce animals that are too fat because the carbon emissions associated with a kilogram of steak from a fat animal are going to be far higher. And what's more, if the animals grow slowly, the, the maintenance emissions going up there, keeping an animal for three years before you process it, is just too much carbon going up. And, and so I see a huge future for younger, leaner, tender beef. And the carbon emissions associated with that carcass are going to be so much lower. I think the, the big thing for the dairy industry is, morally as we look ahead, there's going to be an issue around bobby calves, if you like. People don't like thinking about a, you know, a young calf at four or five days old, three or four days old, being taken away to slaughter. And so I think we're going to have to limit that very much. And I think in the dairy industry, we're going to have to see many more uh, bull calves and surplus heifer calves kept for the, for the beef industry. And if you're going to do that, having something like a Belgian blue across a, a, a Kiwi cross cow is going to produce a really useful beef animal. 
a far more useful beef animal than a traditional British breed across that uh, Kiwi cross cow. And I tend not to be, I mean, I love Angus cattle. I grew up, my scrapbook as a kid is full of, of the, you know, Angus cattle. We had some of the most famous Angus cattle in New Zealand on this farm. Bruce the Seventh of Mangatra was on this farm. You know, he was, he was supreme champion ever shown in New Zealand. And he was by Donald Grant, one of the, one of the great Angus breeders from a bygone time, imported Bruce of Greenyards. And Bruce the Seventh was one of his greatest sons, and he was on this farm. You know, we had Andrew McGaffin imported Erebon of Spittle. We had one of his sons on this farm. Humphrey Bailey imported Black Eyed Labarnalby from Scotland. We had one of his sons on this farm. Uh, and so, you know, my background is a love of Angus cattle. But I look to the future and I, I'm hugely conscious as a scientist that actually efficiency of, of red meat production is going to be really important because otherwise the laboratory stuff will start to compete. We've got to get really carbon efficient at producing a tender and, and to me a tender product that, that isn't too fat because as I said before the more fat you try and put in it the more carbon emissions you'll put up there and we'll run into trouble you know people start being critical of beef production for being you know having too great a carbon emissions and and we don't have to we can produce an efficient product